Hey, so we're having a conversation about, I think, the role of race in the work that theaters do, and specifically about um, court theater. So uh, over the past few months, of course, we've seen, um, you know, increased attention to equity within American theaters, especially theaters that have been predominantly white governed for the past few decades. Uh, and court, of course, has been really active uh, in this space in terms of inclusion and equity. And so we're having this conversation just to talk about that history and about where court is looking to go next. Um, you've been at court now for uh, a little over 25 years, and so you have a history. You have quite a history at court, which I don't have as long a history. So if you would just let us know, um, you know, what has been that history at court theater? My guess is that in some ways, you know, it reflects a history of um, at least attempts at, a, at inclusion and equity in the American theater in general. And so if you would just kind of let us know what that evolution has been at court, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I became artistic director in 1994 following founding artistic director Nick Ruddle. Uh, and immediately began to look at the repertoire because uh, as much as we honor Nick and his legacy, the focus was almost exclusively on uh, European white male playwright classic texts. Um, uh, after some time of trying to diversify the casting, namely, you know, having actors of color play leads in uh, traditional white cast roles in title roles, um, it, it became clear that uh, that wasn't enough to really serve our community and to broaden the idea of what really is a classic. So we had extensive conversations about, you know, what is a classic and how could we really diversify the thinking about what, what we mean by that. It was at that point uh, where we began to commission uh, writers to do adaptations of classic um, African-American canon texts, uh, Invisible Man, Native Son, etc. But the, the really transformative moment was when Ron O.J. Parson came to direct Fences, the first August Wilson uh, court uh, has ever done. And um, we immediately began to see the necessity of Black writers and Black directors needing to really um, uh, make an authentic commitment to Black lives and Black stories and Black voices, which for the last 15 years, um, we have built uh, um, an ongoing legacy about that. Um, uh, that. That kind of brings you up to the current moment, I think. So I know one of the critiques of the arts in America right now, vis-a-vis -vis race, is that representation and the labor of Black folks um, has really served predominantly white theaters well, but that we haven't valued black voices, um, you know, across theaters in the same way. But this issue of the value that black voices have actually brought to theater, or at least representation, I think is one of those issues that um, people have been talking about more and more. I remember seeing that production of Fences. <laughs> it was amazing. So, you know, what impact did did fences have on court and what impact has Ron O.J. Parson being at court have on the theater? Well, it's been a profound one, needless to say. Um, with Ron's signature and unique capacities as a director, and not just in the August Wilson canon, although he has done eight of the 10 and we we're hoping he'll complete that century cycle of Wilson plays in the near future. But um, as we expanded, uh, the idea and elevating and celebrating uh, classics from the African-American canon, uh, it, we began to see, as you might think, uh, not only an extraordinary um, uh, it, it really came about from an ongoing year after year for 15 years authentic commitment to doing that work that uh, many of Chicago's uh, leading artists of color began to see court theater as a place for them and a home for them where they would not only get to do uh, texts and productions that are traditionally thought of as cast with artists of, and actors of color, 
but other texts as well. We've also seen a significant uh, change in, and growth of uh, our audience of color. Um, and because it's the most recent production that uh, we've done, uh, I, I think about the Oedipus trilogy and specifically Oedipus Rex in terms of the ongoing arc of uh, what you're talking about. You know, I'm struck by the fact that we've done three Nick Riddle Awards. Uh, you know, we created that award three years ago. Uh, the first year, Kate Fry won it. And then last year was Alan Gilmore. Uh, and this year, Kelvin Ralston. So I think the fact that this award has gone to um, African-American actors two out of three times does give a sense of the increased importance of that kind of representation in the work that court has done. I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, court has benefited really powerfully from uh, having that representation on its stage. I know that, um, you know, we always know as we're planning the budget <laughs> that August Wilson will uh, sell out. Um, we always know that financially we'll do really well when Ron directs uh, August Wilson. Um, and we've come to rely on that. So, you know, I see the, I think the benefits of that has been really clear. Um, but as we've gone deeper and deeper into that work, what kinds of things have you learned? And as we've sort of come to this present moment where people have recognized and begun to say even more powerfully, like representation isn't enough, um, you know, what have you learned and observed and where do you think the, you know, your work will go next and the theater's work will go next? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a big question. And so let me try to answer part of it because there's many different parts that I would love to talk about. And frankly, having this kind of public discourse about this, uh, on this, creating this kind of um, virtual or digital space for us to have these conversations, I think is also just emblematic of the kind of real paradigm shift in our culture that we court theater have undertaken. As you say, we have benefited greatly from the artists that have come to see court theater as home. Uh, however, um, as we all went into this uh, moment of shutdown of not making theater uh, back in March, uh, when we had to both cancel the run of Lady from the Sea the rest of the run of Iliad and the full production of Gospel Colonus, um, we really, gave, it gave us an opportunity to really examine much more some of the processes and systems by which we court theater as an organization make the work that we do. And as we began to look at that, uh, we really recognized that um, while we have much to be proud of, of representation on stage and artists, as well as expanding or even diversifying, if that's the right word, um, our thinking about what is classic theater uh, and really dealing with some of the inequities that black artists, black voices, black and brown uh, artists of all kinds uh, encounter when they seek to work in quote unquote classic theater, which has been so historically defined as exclusionary um, uh, to them. Um, we've also begun to see how we as an organization uh, and how we function and some of uh, the processes and, and uh, the way we make decisions is really built upon uh, a real history of, uh, I would say personal and, and, and uh, professional uh, abuse and violence and therefore racism towards our valued staff and artists of color. And that really, uh, that awakening, that, that confrontation, that recognition about while we've had some success in some areas, the real work uh, is beyond this inequity, but rather the real work for us is how can we as an organization truly become an anti-racist organization? Um, how can we be a proactive part 
of dismantling the white supremacy that has been part of our culture. And so together with your leadership and the extraordinary full investment from our staff, uh, we have committed ourselves to the necessary anti-racism work about our organization, which we've begun. And I'd love to hear you talk more about some of that. I mean, in the conversations that staff have been having, um, which I know are uh, pretty wide, um, lots of discussions have been happening. Are there any sort of early things that you've identified that uh, you feel like you understand now in a new way that's important? And are there any things that, you know, even at this early stage, you're excited to sort of act on as we move forward? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a list. <laughs> and, and as you know, the, we have begun um, a number of initiatives that you've been leading following our statement that followed the murder of George Floyd back in June this digital space that we're in right now is an, is an example of something that we wanted to do, which was to facilitate conversations uh, with our black artists and black activists within the theater community that helps to help shape our work and help shape our programming. I think the thing that has been most powerful uh, for me uh, amongst many things, I'm just, because uh, there are quite, quite a lot is, um, what, what does it mean for members of our staff, our uh, black and brown uh, staff members? And what does it mean to live within the culture of court theater that has been historically built upon this uh, clear uh, disadvantage um, that they feel or clear lack of uh, opportunity and, and and um, accountability for stuff that they've had to deal with that uh, we court theater have not identified and spoken openly about up to this moment. Um, one of our extraordinary staff members, Kiana, defined this process, I thought quite beautifully, which is we're in the stage of identification about what's been going on uh, and in her sort of four part thinking about this process and boy we got a lot of work to do uh, is the necessity of the identification followed by, followed by how do we strategize about what do we do about what we're discovering and learning about uh, uh, and and that 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 is the anti-racism work as we discover how one group of folk purely because of their race is diminished or given less opportunity is certainly not experiencing fair or equitable opportunity. Um, so therefore the necessity for anti-racism work to dismantle those structures. Uh, our plan as you've defined, and I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking things that you and others on staff have helped me understand is that then to develop a, a plan about exactly what and how we're going to prioritize. And then the final part of that is an accountability part of it. I also want to acknowledge that, you know, I, I come from a tradition in the American theater, uh, first of all, as a white cisgendered male of tremendous privilege and opportunity that others just did not and do not have. As part of that structure, uh, the tradition has been uh, and was what I grew up with that you hire an artist director and he, she, mostly he, <laughs> decides what plays will get done. Well, thanks to your leadership and the work that the entire staff has invested in around this question about power sharing and decision making at the most micro and the most macro level has been profoundly uh, has, has affected me profoundly about what does it mean to create a collaborative uh, environment within the organization as an institution. And my journey as an artist has taught me that the more I can create a safe space in the rehearsal room where there is shared power, shared decision making, and shared opportunity so that 
what we make is the sum of everybody and not any singular or unilateral uh, decision making um, is what I've seen you and the rest of the staff really begin to challenge me as the white male artistic director of decades. Well, Charlie, what about play selection? What about the art that we want to do? Who and what and how has a voice in that? I don't have any answers about that. I'm just sharing where I sense we are right now. Um, so that's that's some thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really struck me is, you know, in sort of your timeline about uh, representation and inclusion and working towards this place of equity in court is how one thing has led to another um, and how you know, doing plays uh, by playwrights like August Wilson or, um, you know, commissioning Nambi Kelly to do an adaptation of Native Son, uh, having Surrette Scott as a director at court, how that work has brought not only a Black audience, but it's also brought Black staff. And how, and even though we're nowhere near where we want to be and need to be, yeah. The way in which having those voices on our staff really changes the dynamics of what we understand and how we come to understand it. Um, so, you know, Ron O.J. Parson has been doing this for over a decade now, but, you know, some more recent hires or hire isn't always the right word, but having uh, Gabby Randall come into the court family as a dramaturg and then an assistant and now associate director. Um, having Regina Fields on staff for a year um, and now most recently Camila Rashid uh, running the our education initiative. Like having their voices represented just teach us so much about inclusion. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I feel like I've, in my career in Chicago, I've done a lot of work to include voices that aren't always included in civic debates, um, but the kind of sensitivity that uh, Gabby and Camila and Regina have brought has been really profound. I mean, even the idea that a mentorship relationship always goes both ways. Yeah. Um, or the way in which uh, Gabby has been sort of redefining how something becomes a classic, that it's not a classic just because in and of itself it's great, but it's a classic because a number of different communities see a reflection of the issues that matter most to them within it. Mm -hmm. And without the input of communities into a piece, the piece itself can't be a classic. It's not just that it's brilliantly written, but a diversity of communities place that moniker of classic on a piece of work because they make it pertinent to themselves and to their own lives. And seeing Gabby make sense of Oedipus Rex and Thebes within the context of the founding of Chicago and De Sable, sort of these origin stories, was one of the places where, you know, that really just blew my mind, <laughs> the kind of reorientation that's so important that she's been bringing uh, to this work. And at the same time, while these voices bring such complexity and richness, um, they make all the conversations more complex, which uh, can sometimes you know, feel difficult, um, but always really satisfactory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unequivocally. I mean, the, the, for example, we've been with Gabby as associate director on Othello uh, since we've been in this pandemic world and uh, the racial strife and, and injustice that we are all now committed to responding to, Gabby's contributions and the way we're thinking about how does a theater do a play like Othello, which is so problematic and complicated, has changed radically. Uh, um, I guess I bring it back to our mission in which how might we create work that is embedded in the classics as we define quite broadly 
and how does that work and that experience of working on it and experience of sharing it in that communal experience of being all together in the theater. Remember when we used to do that? <laughs> and we will do it again, um, that those communal gatherings actually create true and deep transformation for not only individuals, but for communities as well. Uh, uh, so all of this work, and yes, there are uncomfortable conversations and difficult decisions and prioritizations that we're needing to make, but I have to say that um, as you've <laughs> helped define this timeline about kind of building upon the previous experience, it feels that's where court theater is now. And, um, uh, uh, and one of the things I'd love to hear you talk uh, some more about on hell, if you would, is, you know, this is coming, I think you're close to your second year anniversary of being at court theater. Two weeks away from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been a complicated <laughs> two years. <laughs> Thank God you're here. Um, you know, you began a, 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 a process about a stakeholder engagement process that unfortunately the pandemic interrupted, but I would love to hear you talk a little bit about that process because uh, it may also help our community understand that we were in the middle of a, from my point of view as artistic leader and co-leading the organization with you, that strategic process and stakeholder process one of our many goals was that court theater would articulate a, uh, a, a, a heightened and more refined definition of our vision and our mission, building upon all of the success of uh, our 60 plus year history, uh, but most especially how might we be a place where transformation can happen and social and racial injustices be uh, changed and the world made a better place. So I can't wait to continue on that process that got interrupted. In some ways, this anti-racism work is an I vital part of that same process. Although none of us back eight months ago were planning for that stakeholder process to go to that place, or maybe you were, I don't know. Well, I mean, you know, when I was interviewing for this job, and I, of course, I think interviewed with probably like 50 people um, because the University of Chicago's process um, includes you talking to so many people <laughs> over some very long days. You know, one of the things that really excited me about court, people kept presenting as a problem. So um, in those interviews, people kept talking about the fact that court was of the University of Chicago, that it was a classic theater within the history of classic theaters in the United States, and that the University of Chicago exists on land where black folks used to live and no longer do, um, because I don't know if it's so with specifically with our building, but it wouldn't be surprised, but I wouldn't be surprised if eminent domain led to um, you know, our theater being on the particular piece of land that it is. And I know that in the future in this series, we'll talk with folks at the University of Chicago about, um, about race in the university. Um, but the fact that the university and perhaps even specifically our theater is on land, that eminent domain led to the removal of black folks, but that we still exist in a community um, of black folks, you know, while people saw those three entities as having competing interests, I was so excited by that because A, I was excited by the recognition um, of who all the stakeholders were um, or are in the theater and a process by which we got to acknowledge those, that those three sets of stakeholders are co-owners of this theater. And so how do we shift our orientation to acknowledge that um, the community around our theater, which is primarily an African-American community, although not wholly, that the university um, and that the theater, which is to say 
our board members, other people who go to theater, staff who work at theater, and even classic theater specifically, you know, how do we acknowledge that all three sets are co-owners and not just acknowledge it by naming it, but acknowledging it by behaving as though that is so. And so it was important to me for our staff to go out into the community and talk to people. And by the community, I mean, not just the South side, although certainly including the South side, but also talking to folks across the university and talking to folks across theaters um, to see what they thought of the court theater and where they thought court should go so that as we began a formal process of creating our new strategic plan, that there we had a lot of voices who were informing that, people who actually owned this theater. Um, it's sad to me that that process got interrupted because I think it's such an important process. And then in a way, when we go back to it, we'll go back to it knowing even more than we would have because this moment has reminded us um, how critical these conversations are. And Charlie, I don't know why you asking about the stakeholder engagement process has made me think about these things, but for some reason, as I talk about them, I, I have a couple of memories that I'd like to share. Um, and one of them just makes me think about the fact that in theaters that are historically white governed in the United States, when we do the work of inclusion, um, and even the word itself inclusion sort of nods to this, we think of it as our through some kind of nobility mm -hmm. inviting people in or are allowing people in. Right. Um, and I think we wanna go well beyond that to, to sharing power with people who are co-owners, even if we don't acknowledge and treat them as such. And I think about For Color Girls, um, you know, that Sarret Scott directed and, um, and that Gabby was the dramaturg on how we realized really quickly how fast that show would sell out. Um, just how much energy there was for that. And I saw some things in our lobby that I had never seen before, hmm. which is like groups of 12 or 15 women having come as a group asking people to take their photos for posterity's sake. Um, but also the way in which people would linger after the performance was over. Yeah. And in a way, make community to try to heal some of the emotional scars that were reflected in that play. A friend of mine who lives in New York sent me a screenshot from a friend's uh, Facebook page um, she's a black woman who, who for her 40th birthday treated herself to a ticket to for color girls. And, um, as she wrote in her Facebook, uh, page, um, she was so emotionally wrought having sat through the performance that at the end of it, she just wept and she couldn't get up. And so she just sat there and cried and cried and cried. And an older African American woman came over to her and laid hands on her. And eventually that drew the attention of other black women who came over and laid hands on her. Oh, and which of course mirrors what happens in the play itself. And so there's a way in which maybe the play made that moment possible but there's also a way in which the presence of those women made our play meaningful. And I'm just so struck by that and other examples of it, because I feel like the play was given its meaning because it was in service of community. Uh, and I feel like that can't be, um, that we shouldn't up underrepresent the meaningfulness of that which is that we might make plays, but making plays don't matter in and of themselves. They only matter when people make meaning of them. And that a play like For Color Girls was being made meaningful by these black women who had come to see it. I mean, it was made meaningful by lots of other people as well, but I was especially struck by that because we had never seen, I think, so many group sales in that way. 
um, which is to say people organizing themselves to come see this play that was really meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And then with the Oedipus trilogy, uh, which you've already mentioned, you know, the way in which we began conversations with people in the community, but also uh, University of Chicago faculty to ask what do these plays mean to you and how might we make them based on your observations about these plays and the fact that we partnered with the Odyssey Project um, who organized these book groups across the South Side, um, actually two of them in Spanish even. Uh, and so for a few weeks, people studied these plays and made sense of them for themselves and then came and saw our production. Um, and then what they had been thinking sort of um, was in conversation with yours and Gabby's take on Oedipus Rex. In the stakeholder engagement process, one of the things that we heard a bunch of times is that the court theater lobby was the most integrated space people encountered regularly. And so I also think about that role civically of creating an integrated space. And I think part of our challenge is how do we tease out that integration to the point that everyone has an equal voice exactly. and it's mutually beneficial spiritually, emotionally, and even financially, it's good for the theater. As a person of color leading this work in an organization that has been in predominantly white institution, what's that like for you? And, and, and what, what is the kind of personal part of the doing this work, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing why it's important for you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a multi, faceted answer. <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, you know, I have a feeling of gratefulness. You know, I've been attending court shows for a long, long time. And I know I've told you, Charlie, that, um, you know, whenever people would come to town and they would ask, what should they see? Uh, and I would give them the names of theaters um, where I would say, you know, the work here is consist consistently excellent. Um, so anything they're doing will be great. You know, court was always on like a short list of two or three theaters. Uh, so the work has been really meaningful to me for a long, long time. Um, you know, I think about the complications of my own racial identity. I'm an immigrant to the United States from a Caribbean country where race operates in a very different way than it does in the United States. And so people think of me as um, you know, being racially hard to pin down, <laughs> you know, <laughs> am I white? Am I black? Am I Latino? Some people ask, am I Italian? Am I Greek? Being an immigrant, I moved here when I was 11, means that for those first 11 years of my life, I had a very different experience than a person of color in the United States would. So even as I come to court as a person of color in a leadership position, I come with all of the experiences of someone who lived in a different country, who saw race very differently for those first 11 years. But then I come with the experiences that I've had since I was 11. <laughs> and I think I was 50 when I came to the court theater of 51. So, you know, I had about 40 years of experience of race in this country. So, you know, in my also almost 25 years of living in Chicago, I've also been really close to the University of Chicago in many ways. You know, a lot of work that I've done have been in cooperation with the university. And so I came here sort of recognizing the value or feeling a value um, for the university and for this theater. Um, but also, and I know it's complicated because I'm not an African-American. I wasn't born in the United States and um, but also I come with this incredible um, excitement about the arts that the South Side has produced historically and continues to produce. Um, there's just such incredible talent on the South Side, but there's a lot of culture on the South Side that I'm very drawn to in a very visceral, emotional way. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I came to court really valuing the theater, valuing the neighborhood in which this theater sits and the university um, that uh, houses uh, this theater. The experience beyond that 
I think is a fairly typical one. Um, you know, there are folks who express a lot of reticence and skepticism about whether or not a classic theater can really be relevant to people of color, um, which, you know, as a person of color who has found a ton of relevance in classics, <laughs> um, you know, from William Faulkner to Toni Morrison, um, you know, that's to me is sort of a specious argument, yeah. um, but it's one that I hear all the time. And this work of being more, of giving the community more voice in the work that we do and shaping the work is a hard one. I mean, it's been a hard one, um, not because I'm not convinced of it and not because you're not convinced of it because you actually bought into it immediately and was very, very motivated by it immediately. But because there are people on staff who sort of drag their feet, um, you know, there are all kinds of folks who just for whatever reasons um, choose to be skeptical of that. Um, and one of the things that this moment has done is that it really accelerated the rate at which people want this work to happen. <laughs> and so I'm incredibly grateful um, for that. It does feel really, really weird to be a person of color. I'm not African-American, but I'm a person of color within a theater who's been doing this work and whose staff has had the recognition that we need to do it even faster and even more smartly than we were doing it before. Because I will tell you at least twice a week, I think to myself, why am I the one leading this? <laughs> like, why am I not the beneficiary of this? But instead, why am I doing the emotional and psychic work of being the person pushing this forward? And then immediately I remember what a privilege it is to get to lead this work. And because people are now articulating in a more public way their support for this work. So, you know, our past board chair and our present board chair have both been so visibly supportive of this work. And as a person of color, it's just a relief for that to happen, mm -hmm. to have two very influential white men say publicly that this work is really important and really support it. Because honestly, up until this point, and I still feel it, I feel like I could be fired any day, right? Like any day I could say something that pisses off a big donor or that pisses off a board member and someone could begin a campaign to end my tenure here. Mm -hmm. Now I know it's not that simple, I, you know, I think people of color live with that fear all the time. Um, and I've begun to hear people say, I've begun to hear people of color on social media say, you know, that's the thing we have to stop worrying about. <laughs> right? Like we have to stop worry, worrying about being fired. And instead, we really have to focus on making the things that we know we need to do happen. So it's very, I mean, it's, for me, it's very complicated as everything regarding race for me personally is because racially people don't always know what to make sense of me. I began my life in a different country and had a totally different set of experiences and came here and began to have a different set of experiences, but I hold both the past and the more recent present um, together. And then this work is emotionally taxing for everybody. I mean, when I think about, especially for black folks, the kind of emotional work that they've been doing and that now we're asking them to do even more, I mean, it's just really tiring. Um, so I feel both this sense of optimism and the sense that this is an honor to get to do alongside the, um, you know, the fear and the worry of what it means for you personally to try to push this work forward. I mean, I think all people of color within predominantly white governed organizations know how important it is to like watch your P's and Q's 
every single mm -hmm. moment of every single day. Um, you know, I think about one of our black staff members who said recently, she always felt like she had to be the best dressed person in the room. Mm -hmm. And I totally get that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, you yeah, know, it's complicated. It's great and it's not great. <laughs> Well, thank you for that very personal and very, I'm, so, I'm, I'm very moved by what you said on Ellen. I guess I just want to acknowledge that, you know, you said from the very beginning in the hiring process that this was the work that you wanted to come to court to do. I had, and I was like, yeah, great. This is what we need. This is what we need. I hope he wants to come. But the fact that the way you've been leading this, uh, it's, it's truly an honor that you're part of court theater and and I'll just say as the white longtime artistic director uh, I want to acknowledge because I've done a lot of things n not as well as I wished I had and one of them is what many people in of in my position as a white male often fall into which is the sense of white fragility and feeling like one is too afraid and it's going to make mistake and is going to be too uncomfortable and I get, just got to say that thanks to the culture environment that you have created and demanded that we lean into this work. Um, if you believe in fairness and justice and equity for everybody, which I do, uh, it's my work to work on, the, my private work to do about white fragility, and it's my work in court theater to lean forward into this anti-racism work or as you've heard me say um, quite a few times recently, opting out of this work, I consider not an option, I consider it even violence. Yeah. And, and we have created, thanks to your leadership, a possibility, we got so much to learn and so much to do and so much to conversations to have uh, around a deep listening and a genuine collaborative sense together. Uh, so I just want to really honor you for that. Yeah. Well, Charlie, I mean, I think, you know, we all, including you and me, have done things wrong and need to learn how to be smarter and better to do this work. Um, and, you know, we haven't done so much that we should be patting ourselves on the back, but we've done a lot. And, and by we, you know, I mean you and others, because I've only been at court for two years. But, you know, we had an HR issue um, about a year ago. And it's the kind of HR issue that could have gotten us in trouble, um, you know, for racial insensitivity. And I was so struck when that artist raised the issue that some Black artists and activists who are really powerful, smart folks said, I think you should have a conversation. I think you should ask for a conversation um, because this isn't the kind of behavior that we would expect at a place like court. Now, maybe it is the kind of behavior that one should expect at a place like court, but there's something about the history of what court has done that has made it meaningful to a lot of people of color. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to come up with hard and fast numbers, but I think something like a quarter of our paying audience at court are African-American. Um, and when you include high school matinees and free tickets that we distribute um, through our partners, et cetera, you know, that number goes up to about a third of the people who come to court are people of color. That's really meaningful. And we couldn't get to the point of being in conversation with Southside residents about what we're going to do in the future if they hadn't already begun to trust us by coming to see our shows one after the other. So, you know, one of the things that I think I, I realized about, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago when I was executive director at Illinois Humanities was that the time in my life where I generated the best ideas are gone. <laughs> like, I'm ju I just don't, I'm not as in touch with the world in the way that I used to be or something. And so the best ideas are coming from our younger staff members. Uh, and so, you know, I think about seven, eight years ago, I realized that I have to listen really carefully 
when young people speak, because that's where the smartest ideas are coming from. And I think, you know, the work that we've been doing at court over the past few months, since the protests about George Floyd begun, it's just made so much more important, this work of listening. Um, and again, the work that court theater had done got us to the point where we have the kind of staff that we do. Um, and again, it's nowhere near where it needs to be. Yeah. But at least we have, you know, enough folks on our staff that we do have people that we can listen to mm -hmm. and thus be able to make smarter, more impactful and more just decisions. Well, that's why when Camila Rashid, our new director of education and Gabby brainstormed to create this kind of digital space for us to open up to our community. Um, I welcome that. Frankly, I was a bit hesitant to be the first uh, on it because I wanted to listen and not talk. <laughs> but they thought, no, Charlie, you and Angel should launch this and just to acknowledge that in launching this, this is just to share where we're at now and that we're in this place of process and learning. And I can't wait to for future Race Matters digital sharing so that I can listen and listen and listen more. Uh, you're right that, you know, Court has a has a, some pretty good history about artists on stage in the last 10 years. We're well over 50% of the artists that the actors that appear on stage are artists of color. In the last couple of years, it's been even over 60%. But that's just the beginning, this question about black and brown voices and stories and lives. We got a lot of work to do in that area, as I mentioned earlier about uh, sort of curation and artistic uh, decision-making, season planning. Well, Charlie, your comment just now just made me think of another thing as you talked about the fact that this is the first Race Matters conversation. Yeah. Um, I mean, if I can just talk about the moment where this sort of series, if we'll call it that, um, came into being. So, you know, this series came about when, um, when activists who were working within the theater asked theaters to open their lobbies um, to um, protect uh, protesters who were being arrested um, and attacked by the police. Um, and it was a very complicated moment for us because, you know, we're part of the University of Chicago. We know that a lot of Black activists don't feel comfortable on the campus. Um, and in the middle of a pandemic, um, you know, maybe it didn't feel uh, like it was necessarily an easy decision to make to open our lobby. Um, especially again, given the fact that um, the physical occupation of spaces is determined by the university using, um, you know, very smart research from the medical center regarding COVID-19. So we were in a situation where there was this, there was this movement happening, there was this discussion and there was this need for protection. Um, and we found ourselves in a place where we couldn't open our lobby. Um, for a variety of reasons, but we really wanted to support the work of these activists and these protesters. And so in having a conversation about the problem, and the problem is how do we create a space of protection um, or a space that could be a space of protection, we thought, well, it's important for us to support the work of these activists and these protesters. And if we can't open a physical space, can we open a digital space? Exactly. Uh, and you know that came out of that. That was you know out of ideas by uh, certainly staff members who are younger than you and I. <laughs> and I don't want to call people young because they may not think of themselves in that way. Uh, but certainly younger than than you and I. But I you know I think about how that very complex moment was a moment that we could think of as a, like a problem that could bury you emotionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but how do you have conversations about those in those moments so that you come out of it with something that feels like the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I just want to sort of acknowledge that moment yeah. um, as we 
talk as you know as we're in this conversation um and then um you know in terms of the work to do uh i still feel like there's just no way that court can become the place that it's in the process of becoming without all of our staff being in conversation more regularly with all members of our stakeholder groups. So not only does our staff have to know this outside much better than it does, and by our staff, I mean every single member of our staff, because they have to have relationships with, because they have to be able to hear what people are saying, um, and they need to have those relationships across the South Side, but they also have to within the university as well, um, because we're very much of the University of Chicago. You know, while we live in what can feel like a culture of scarcity, we actually live and operate within a, within a culture of abundance. And the university is part of that ab abundance, even if it feels like scarcity to them, <laughs> having run nonprofits, <laughs> it feels like right. a culture of abundance. Um, but there are also just such incredible resources of faculty and students and other people within the university. And so I feel like as we move forward, our staff um, will need to do a better job of being in constant conversation with the university community and the Southside community in the way that we already are with the theater um, community. So I feel like that is one of the really big things that we need to accomplish. Um, and uh, I know that while we've made a ton of progress in um, representation on our stages, we still have a ways to go in terms of the directors and uh, designers and even carpenters and electricians yeah. and fundraising folks <laughs> and other positions across the theater. Yeah. Um, because this, because our work is made by people across the theater, not just by the actors or even the actors and the directors. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, we have to do things like trainings like that everybody has to do. Um, but for me, what's incredibly important is one, um, for all of our staff to be in conversation with a broader section of people mm -hmm. as a part of their work every day, um, but also to have a plan that's well thought out that has, and this is just because this is the way I do my work maybe, a plan that's articulated that everyone is aware of that has metrics that we can track to make sure that we're making progress and that we're having conversations regularly as we track the progress of our plan to make sure that we really are doing this i had a colleague in one of my previous jobs who used to say you you measure what matters the most to you mm. and so i feel like measuring the impact of our plan. I mean, having the plan articulate in the first place and then measuring its impact over time is going to be really necessary because it's easy to claim success exactly, um, and then forget why we were doing things in the first place. And then little things that add up to big things disappear. Um, so checking in on that plan together over time, I think is, is, really important. And I'm excited about this series because um, we'll get to hear exactly. from um, so many people who have made court theater possible. And you and I are maybe the first conversation that will air, but we're not the most important people in making court what it is. Um, so I'm excited for these conversations and to um, hear them myself. Me too.